All right, so this morning, we're going to be closing out the series I started quite a while ago on Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Uh, obviously, it's a real famous passage, especially that first portion, and that's where I started the series. Um, it's, a, it's a time two series where that whole uh, series of, of verses there, the first, uh, what is it, eight verses that have all these various times to do different things. Uh, we preach through every single one of those uh, different subjects. So if you're interested in any of that, if there's something that was listed here that you go, oh, you know, I'm curious what you, what you had to teach about that, you could go back and find them on our, on our YouTube channel. Um, but we're closing out with that last phrase there in verse number eight, where the Bible says, a time to love, a time to hate. I already preached on that. And this is a time of war and a time of peace. And all of these things, and you know, just draw your attention, everything that's, that's listed here, there is a time and a place for everything that's mentioned here. And some may seem like, uh, you know, they're, they're vilified so much that people get too extreme of thinking there's never a time, you know, like there's never a time for war. No, there is a time for war. You know, obviously we know there's a time for peace. I think that's pretty uh, evident, self-evident as a Christian. Same thing with love, right? There's always a time to love, but you know what? There's a time to hate too. And we saw that earlier. I preached on that uh, previously. So there's a lot of different things here the Bible's talking about. But we're going to focus in on a time of war and a time of peace. And I like to start off just covering what I consider to be the more obvious of the two, which would be, in this case, a time of peace. And, you know, we know that Christ is the Prince of Peace. We know that we're called to live as much as possible at peace with, with those around us. Uh, I'm going to start with just the peace of the gospel. The gospel is literally something that brings us peace. And you think about the difference between peace and war, you know, the, the reason why the gospel brings peace is because as a sinner, we're at enmity with the Lord. We have a problem with God as a sinner when we've broken his commandments, we've broken his laws, we've broken his statutes. So we've got an issue with God that has to be dealt with. It has to be straightened out. It needs to be cleared up. It needs to be rectified. And the only way to do that is through the gospel of Jesus Christ is by putting your faith and trust our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because he paid for your sins. He paid that ultimate punishment, which is why then that gospel brings in peace so you could be at peace with the Heavenly Father uh, because you're no longer estranged from him. Through the gospel, you could um, have that atonement made for you. So I'll read some verses that just reference the gospel of peace, a real famous passage, Romans chapter 10, verse 15, the Bible says, and how shall they preach except they be sent, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. This is the good news, right? This is what, this is really what Christianity is all about, the good news, the gospel, bringing forth that message of peace. It is good. Ephesians 2.15, the Bible says, Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace. And then in verse 17 it says, And came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. The, the gospel message, the message of the Bible, is overarching a message of peace and love, right? Those are good things. Colossians 1, verse 20, the Bible says, and having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. And then John 6, 33, the Bible says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So there is peace to be found in the Lord, there is peace in the gospel. Uh, the fruit of the Spirit, the Bible says, one of the fruits of the Spirit is peace. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5, the, the fruit of the, of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. And when you have the Holy Spirit, of course, when you're saved, you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit of God. And that's one of the fruits is peace. The Bible says in Romans 8, 6, for to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Peace, and there's just that 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 big difference of the the two uh, ends of the spectrum. You've got the flesh, you've got the spirit. The flesh is going to bring uh, death and destruction and misery, and the spirit's going to bring the life and the joy and the peace. 
Uh, Romans 14, 19, the Bible says, Let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. We are called to live in peace. This is a good thing. Again, a good thing. And I know this isn't something like, Pastor Burzens, can you just tell me something I don't already know? Right? Like this is pretty common knowledge that we are called to live in peace. And peace is a good thing. And we shouldn't be seeking war. Now look, I'm going to be speaking mostly spiritually, but even carnally, you know, we shouldn't be so ready to just go to war and, you know, there's a lot of war hawks, especially in uh, the government. You know, there's, there's some, some groups of people that just, man, they just are ready to fight wars for just about anything, it seems like, right? For, to the observer, it seems like there's some people out there that are just like bent on having war. You know, we should, we should be going to war as more of like a last result not as a first option. Now, there is a time for war. There is a time for war. But, you know, the, the, the primary function or the primary focus should be that of peace. We should always be seeking and ensuing peace as much as possible. But I'll tell you what, it's not peace at all costs. There are lines that need to be drawn. And whether that be, you know, physically, like as a nation, uh, or whether it be spiritually speaking as well in the spiritual fight that is going on. The Bible says in um, 2 Corinthians 13, verse 11, Finally, brethren, farewell, be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. Ephesians 4, 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Mark 9, 50, the Bible says salt is good, but the salt lost its saltness. Wherewith you, shall you season, will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace one with another. Hebrews 12, 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Now turn, if you would, to Psalm 120. Psalm 120. Lots of admonitions to peace. Right, and I said that, that that is. I know I'm not spending very much time of my sermon on this subject, on the peace aspect of the sermon, because that should be the default. That should just be what we're interested in. That should be the goal. Just let's try to have peace, as much as lieth in you, you know, to 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 live peaceably with all men. That is what we should be striving for. But that's not always going to be the case. So, which is why I want to focus on the time of war a little bit more and kind of go into that because we, we want to be well balanced and at the same time we want to deal with this appropriately too and know, well, when is that time of war? If, if we should be striving to live at peace as much as possible, well, when is it proper, when is it appropriate? To, to get in the war mindset and, and to consider ourselves as being in a war. Psalm 120, verse number 6, is, is a very good summary of a truth that exists in the Christian life in general. This was, uh, I believe, a psalm of David, but it's the word of God and is very applicable uh, to us nonetheless. Verse number 6, the Bible says, My soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. I am for peace. But when I speak, they are for war. Amen. And there are going to be people that, hey, you, you want peace, right? I don't, I'm not looking for trouble. I'm not trying to cause trouble. We're not trying to start a war or start a fight. But you know what? There is this thing called the Word of God. There's this thing called the Bible, right? And we're commanded to not hide the glorious light of the gospel. We're not supposed to censor the word of God. We are supposed to preach the truth. Amen. Now look, the word of God in its entirety, the Bible is the truth. Every verse, every line, every chapter, you know, we're Christians here. We believe this to be the word of God. If it's the word of God, it's the truth. God cannot lie and we need to be spreading this truth. But you know what happens when you spread the truth though? We speak, we speak out of love, we speak because we care for people, we speak because we want people to know the truth, we want to enlighten people, we want to help people and guide them with the word of God, 
But you know what? When we speak, oftentimes other people, they're for war. Like the Bible says, why do the heathen rage? There's a lot of people, and it's not everybody, but there's definitely some people out there that when they even hear the word of God, go into a rage, and they're ready to go into attack mode, and they're ready to go into war. And what, first of all, we have to be aware of that, which I think most people probably are. You see it. You see people flip out over this stuff. But two, then how do you deal with that? And when is it appropriate to engage in that? The Bible says in Luke chapter 12, turn if you would to Ephesians chapter 6. Luke chapter 12, verse 51, Jesus Christ speaking this while he's on the earth. He says, suppose ye that I am come to give peace on earth. I tell you, nay. Those are the words of Jesus Christ himself, the Prince of Peace, right? He's saying, do you think that I came to just bring peace on earth? Now, he did come with the gospel, right? He came to be, the, he is the gospel, right? He is, he's offered himself up, a sacrifice for our sin. Since Jesus Christ came in love, and he loves the lost, and he, he gave his own life for the whole world. Yet, this same man, the Son of God, said, Do you think that I came to give peace on earth? I tell you, no, nay, but rather division. Because he knows the truth, and he knows that the truth divides, and he knows just as much as the light is, is divided from the day, that there's going to be children of light and children of darkness. And they're going to oppose themselves. And once you bring in the truth, people are going to fall on either one side or the other of it. You're going to accept the truth, you're going to love the truth, or you're going to hate the truth and reject the truth. And, and that, is, that will happen... And, you know, tying into my Calvinism series, because people have free will. Because people could choose for themselves what they want to believe, and some people don't like to hear the truth. And in fact, you know, a lot of people don't like to hear the truth if the truth is some way negative about them. And that's part of our sinful human nature to not want to hear something that's negative about us. And if the Bible is telling us, if God's telling us, hey, you're a sinner, hey, you're not supposed to be doing what you did, what you did is wrong, what you did is worthy of a punishment in hell, a lot of people don't like to hear that. Now, if you like the truth, you'd be willing to just accept the truth as it is, good or bad, doesn't matter, hey, I, I just want to know what's right, I want to know what's true, and I will conform to the truth, I will conform to the word of God, not try to make a God after my own image or make a God in my own mind of some idol, some fake God that doesn't even exist. But you know what? People do that. It's very common. Jesus himself said, hey, I didn't come to bring peace. I, I, I tell you, neighbor, rather division. He says, for, for from henceforth, there shall be five in one house divided, three against two and two against three. The father shall be divided against the son, the son against the father, the mother against the daughter, and the daughter against the mother the mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And these are some of the closest relationships that will be divided. He's mentioning family members, right? So it's not just a division between two strangers, right? This type of division cuts so close and it cuts so deep that it will divide literal family members. That for any other purpose, yeah, you would be right, close-knit, tight together, tight family, but you know what? The things of God, when it comes to the truth of the Holy Bible, that is enough to, to divide between even brothers, even mother and daughter, even father and son. The Word of God will do that. Ephesians chapter 6 now, we're going we're gonna to start looking at more of the verses that talk about uh, the war side of things. It's a time of peace, absolutely, but because of this division, because of the power of the Word of God, and just because of, of the truth and people's reaction to it, there's going to be times of war, and we need to be prepared for it. Now, the Bible uses a lot of different illustrations to help us understand things and a lot of different ways of describing things in a sense of like, um, just, to, just to give us a good, a good understanding. 
One of the ways is by referencing or talking about soldiers and wars, or be a good soldier for Jesus Christ, or we're going to look at those passages, because part of the Christian life is engaged in a battle and is engaged in a war. Part of the Christian life is going to be involved in ministering, serving one another, right? So we're going to see a lot of, we'll see a lot of references to that, of being a servant and, and serve uh, people and serve man as you would serve Jesus Christ. And, and, you know, there's many different areas of our life where it's giving us different examples of, hey, this is how you should be here. This is how you should be here. It's not just, Christianity isn't just single faceted. It's not just one face. It's not just like, you know, some people like to say, well, just God is love and that's it. And there's nothing else. And, and that's all you need to know about God. Well, no, God is multifaceted. We have, we have a, a complex God, not just a super simple, just one thing only. Now, is God love? Absolutely. Does God love tremendously? Yes. Is he long-suffering? Yes. Is he merciful? Yes. But does God have wrath? Yes. I mean, if God didn't have wrath, hell wouldn't exist. But there is a heaven and a hell, and they were both created by the Lord. And, and to try to reject the side that you don't like is folly. It's foolishness. We should want to know the truth for the truth's sake. Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to read about the, the armor of God. The, the Bible is instructing believers, hey, you need to be geared up in armor. Now, why else would you need armor unless you're going out to battle, right? If everything's just fine and you're safe and there's no war going on, you don't need to wear armor, right? People have a target on them, you know, the, the Secret Service or whoever, you know, political leaders, when they go out I'm sure many of them have like bulletproof vests on and they're wearing their own armor. But the same guys that, that you know, when they're on the job, when they're going out to battle, I mean, just even soldiers themselves, right? You're going out to fight in a war. You better believe they're going to have the helmet on. They're going to have all the gear on, bulletproof vests and all that. When you're going out to war. But when they come back home and they're done and they've served their tour and they're, they're going on vacation with their family, they're probably not going to be all geared up with all that stuff, right? It's not appropriate. It doesn't make sense. Well, the Christian life isn't just some big vacation here on earth. We are engaged in a battle. Ephesians 6, verse number 10, the Bible reads, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And this is a great passage that explains what is our battle, right? So is our battle a physical battle that we need to take up arms and go out and fight the evildoers and the wicked people and, and get our guns and go out and just start destroying wickedness from off the earth? No. No, that's not the battle. So when we're talking about a time of war and a time of peace here, you know, spiritually speaking, our spiritual battle, our spiritual war is not a physical one. And it's important to understand that too. And, you know, I, I try to be as clear about this as possible because I don't want some people who are just mentally unhinged, you know, hearing some preaching from the word of God and going off and just taking matters in their own hands, thinking that they have all authority to go out and just and, and kill a bunch of people because you don't. You know, God has placed institutions, specifically the government, in charge of being responsible for the punishment of evildoers. And, and they have that power to enforce laws and things like that. So we hear preaching, you know, I'm going to preach through the whole word of God, and I'm going to teach on the morality and the laws that God has ordained and what God would say is appropriate and what God's justice would be in a just society. And we go through and we'll look back, and we've, you know, I've done this in the past, where we look at Old Testament laws that were righteous judgment. And God gave them laws to say, hey, this is how you ought to run things in a godly society where God is the king. And those things haven't changed as far as God is concerned on what's right and what's not right. What's a righteous judgment? What is justice according to God in God's eyes? And a righteous society would be seeking what does God think is just? Not just what does man think is justice. What, where does justice even come from? It's going to come from God. 
So if we want to know what is just, what is appropriate, what should be the right punishment for somebody, we ought to be looking to the Word of God for that. But it doesn't mean that you just go off now and say, well, I'm going to enforce all of God's laws. No, that's not our battle. That's not our fight. Right? For example, the Bible teaches that a rape is someone who forces another person, forces a woman, they ought to be put to death. Now, our justice system, our injustice system, doesn't think so. They have a different penalty for the rapist. Okay, but that's out of line with the Word of God. Now, I don't think God is happy with the penalty that people are putting on criminals that don't line up with God's justice, with God's penalties. And I think that goes both ways. So whether someone uh, governs being too strict and, and, and too harsh on people or being too lenient on people. And the Bible says over and over again, especially when it comes to capital crimes, death penalty crimes, he's saying, look, don't take any satisfaction for those people. You need to put them to death. And what that means is don't make any deals. Don't be uh, accepting any other type of payment for their crime. They must be put to death. But that's not the society we live in. So let's just go ahead and get all of our, our, our guns together and start killing people. No, no. No, that's not our battle. It's not our fight. To preach about those things. It's important to know those things. We ought to know the mind of God. We ought to know what's right and what's wrong and know what proper justice is in the eyes of God. But it's not our job to go out and, and, and take the physical fight. That's not it at all. Because, why? Because the Bible says here, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It's not a literal physical fight. It's not this physical battle that we're engaging in but it's against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. There are evil forces at work. There are evil people at work. But, but what we're doing is we're fighting the principalities. We're fighting the powers. We're fighting all the propaganda and the sin culture that's trying to get crammed down everybody's throat, and we need to fight against that. And there's a battle against that going on. I mean, open up your eyes if you haven't seen it already. It's enough to make you vomit if you're paying attention to what's going on. Children are being targeted. They've been targeted for a long time. It's just becoming more and more and more obvious. There's a lot of predators out there. There's a lot of evil people, a lot of wicked people that are trying to normalize the most perverted behavior. Vile, disgusting acts are trying to be forced into being not just tolerated and accepted, which they never should be anyways, but now also promoted and exalted, and you better celebrate perversion or else. That's what's happening in our country. And that's what's happening in many places around the world, not even just here, but it's, it's a result primarily of the wicked influences in this country. But it's, it's spiritual wickedness in high places. People have a lot of power, a lot of pedophile, weirdo, devil-worshipping people in, in positions of power that are promoting this garbage. That's our fight. That's the battle. But how do we fight against it? Well, we're fighting against principalities and powers, so we're going to fight against it with the Word of God. And the Bible tells us, though, how should we arm ourselves for this battle? How do we get prepared for this battle? Say, okay, well, there's a battle going on, there's a spiritual war going on. I want to be a part of it. Well, good, because you don't really have a choice anyways. You're a child of God. You are in this. You've been conscripted to fight in this battle. You've got the Holy Spirit of God residing inside of you. You are a spiritual being. You're part of the spiritual war anyways. You want to be prepared because you know what? The enemy doesn't care if you're fighting or not. Obviously, they don't want you fighting, but the enemy wants all of the, the people who stand for the truth destroyed. And you know what? That day is coming. When the Antichrist comes into power and the mark of the beast is put forward, into law where everyone's going to be required to take the mark of the beast, those that don't take the mark are going to be put to death. And you know who's not going to be taking the mark? Believers in Jesus Christ. Why? Because you're going to have to worship and serve the Antichrist and, and the beast 
Like, no, I'm not going to be imprinted with the name of the beast. I'm a child of God, right? And those that don't take it are going to be ordered and put to death. So that day is coming. And we know that day is coming, but we don't just throw up our hands and say, oh, well, there's nothing we can do about it anyways. No, we fight. We, we stand on the word of God. We stand for the truth. Why? Because there's a lot of people that still will be influenced by your efforts and by your fight. And there's still good that could be done, and many people would still be saved from, uh, from hell. So let's see what the Bible says on how we should equip ourselves. Verse 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins. And man, I wish more believers would just stand Amen. instead of lay down and cower and buckle under the pressure and go, oh, I might lose my job if I say something. If I take a stand, I might lose my job. Well, did the Bible say take a stand unless it's going to actually cause some discomfort, unless it means you're going to lose your job? Is that, is that the caveat? Hey, soldier, take a stand. Well, I mean, unless you might you know, take some bullet or something, then, then don't take a stand. Is that, is that what we tell soldiers that go off into war? All right, we're standing against the enemy. There's the enemy over there. We need to, to defeat the enemy. But, you know, I mean, if they really come aggressively at you and scare you, then just, yeah, it's better just to hide. That's not a soldier. That's a coward. And we have a lot of spiritual cowards that don't seem to really love the word of God or the truth because when the rubber meets the road and it's time to, you're in a position where, you ought to be standing on the word of God and standing for what's right. You lay down. You close your mouth. You don't say anything. Because you're worried. You're scared. Hey, be a soldier. So how are you going to stand? How about you get equipped with the whole armor of God? Stand therefore, verse 14, having your loins girt about with truth. You need to know the truth. If you, want, if you want to stand for what's right, you need to know the truth. How are you going to know the truth? Well, you need to get in the Word of God for yourself. Okay, stop relying on what other people are telling you the Bible says and get in it for yourself. Know the truth for yourself so you can stand on the truth. Loins girt about with the truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. Why don't you start living right? Get the sin out of your life. Right? Have that defense of not just being called out as a stinking hypocrite. Oh, you believe the Bible, but you do this, 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 this. Yeah, you're going to be real effective that way, right? No. Have, have the powerful testimony that says, look, I believe this, and I'm also putting it into practice. It's not just a, a thought, a, a philosophy. It's, it's reality. And look. We know nobody's perfect, and everybody knows that nobody's perfect. But there's a far cry between being not perfect and living in drunkenness and fornication and wickedness, you know, and, and all manner of sin. Those are, you don't have to be like that. Okay, no one's going to want to listen to you if you're, living, if you're living that wickedly. Verse 15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Hey, be a soul winner. That's how you're going to be able to stand. You've got, your, you've, got, you've got the truth, right? You've got righteousness. Hey, get your feet shod. And why is it your feet shod? Because we're supposed to go and preach the gospel, not wait for the, for, for the lost to come to you. That would be then maybe getting your rear end padded so you could sit down and wait for people to come to you. No, that's not what the Bible says. Say, hey, get your feet ready to go out and reach the people with the gospel of peace. Amen. Verse 16, above all, most important thing, above all, take the, sh the, the shield of faith. Right? We trust in God's word. Don't, don't waver. Especially when things get heated, when the battle's getting hot and fiery and, and the, the, the tribulation or the persecution is coming against you really hot, keep that shield of faith. You know you're on the right side. You know you're serving a God that is almighty and all-powerful anyway. So no matter what fear tactic the enemy might try to use against you, trust in God. Seriously, if you... If, if you were to be threatened with your very life for a stand on the word of God, 
Are you going to be more afraid of what a person can do to you than just the God that can actually defend you? Right? I mean, trust in the Lord who is the defense. You think God can't take care of that evil person that wants to do you harm? The, the Bible is full of stories where God is defending his people from the aggressor, from the, the evildoer. It's full of those stories. So have that faith. Have that shield of faith so that you can stand, so that you don't buckle, so you don't back down. Keep that faith in the Lord. Amen. Taking the shield of faith, wherewith you, may, you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Why? Because they're shooting at you. They're going to want to hurt you and destroy you. Spiritually, this is, this is what's going on. There's the people who stand for wickedness don't like us very much. You know, we're called the hate group. And I don't know if you're visiting, maybe you didn't know that. We're called a hate group. And it's true. Okay, we're called a hate group. And I, I know you probably sensed all the hate oozing out of all the people here when you walked in, but wicked people call us the haters. And you know what, though? I, I'll say guilty as charged in this sense. I do hate. Okay, I hate the things that the Bible tells me to hate. So a lot of people don't like that, though, because they want you to be accepting of everything. But I say, no, I'm gonna, I am going to do my best to hate the things that God tells me to hate and love the things that God tells me to love. Amen. So, yeah, I, I don't think it's even possible to love everything because the same people that say they love all and they accept all and they're all inclusive, they don't want to include me. <laughs> they don't want to have anything to do with me. They want me out. So we're inclusive except for you. <laughs> And, and they're just being hypocrites, right? Why don't you just come out and say, I hate you, and say, I don't love everybody? Because you don't. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody loves everybody. Let's see a raise of hand. How many people are just love Adolf Hitler, Mao Zedong, you know, all these, these uh, despots and people who have just put tons of people to death and had some really, really, really wicked, bad ideas? Who loves, you know, Ted Bundy and Jeffrey Dahmer and John Wayne Gacy and just loves these people and just thinks it's, they're just great people? Nobody. Nobody. Be honest. Verse 17, more of the uh, spiritual armor. And then the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So we have all these defensive armor. Of course, armor is defensive to help protect you. You need the helmet of salvation, uh, trusting in the word of God, obviously protecting your main asset, your head uh, with being saved, with, with uh, your faith in the Lord, and then the sword of the spirit. So, so our, our weapon here, again, just further illustrating, is a physical battle. He's not like and, and the, the war, uh, the, the sword being your, your AR-15. But that's not your sword, right? Your sword being the AK-47. No, the sword is the word of God. It's the word of God. That's, that's our battle weapon. That's, that's what we use to engage in battle. It's, it's the truth. It's, it's God's word. This is the fight that we're fighting. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Even the apostle Paul, while he's in prison, he's saying, I am an ambassador in bonds. Like, I've already been arrested and in prison for doing this very thing. Hey, pray for my boldness, too. I need some boldness in this area. And think about that. Like, that makes more sense of needing boldness when you are literally being afflicted by, like, being tossed into prison. That makes a lot of sense. You know what doesn't make sense to me? Christians who get, like, like, in the United States of America, you are not being rounded up and beaten out in the streets and whipped and thrown into prisons for telling people about Jesus Christ. Yet, they are way more cowardly and way less bold than the Apostle Paul was who was going through all of those things. 
A lot of people will pray for revival. You don't like what you're seeing, but then you're not actually being a part of what it would take for things to turn around. Amen. You have to put yourself out there. You have to yield yourself to the will of God, meaning, hey, I don't care what man's going to do to me. I'm going to stand for the truth. Turn if you would to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Reaffirming Ephesians chapter 6 here with the battle being not against flesh and blood, against principalities and powers. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. The Bible says this in verse number 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Look, look, we, we, yes, we are physically in bodies. Like we have a fleshly body but we don't war after the flesh. Our battle is not a battle of the, a fleshly battle. Verse 4 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. It's not a fleshly battle. It's, that's not our weapon, but mighty. Look, our weapons aren't carnal, but they're mighty. We do have very powerful weapons. It's not a nuke. It's not, it's not a, a RPG, it's, it's, not, it's not these, you know, bazookas, it's not a carnal weapon that you might think is very mighty. It's actually more powerful than those. But mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, right? The strongholds that are put in place by the wicked people, those are the powers and principalities that are set up that we are trying to tear down and destroy. Verse 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. It's, this is the spiritual battle. It's, it's a battle of words and of the mind and of, and of these principalities of powers that, that we need to get out there, the truth that needs to get to go out there, the the obedience to the word of God, to Christ, to, to sink in and pierce the hearts of people at large. That's what we need. That's what's going to bring real change. Real change doesn't happen through politics. You're not going to vote real change in our morality in this country. Sorry, not going to happen. I mean, it, I, I think it's a fool's errand to go and try to fix our political system as opposed to being engaged in the spiritual problem that we have going on in this country. Amen. The politics will work itself out. And you know what? God will make sure. If, 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 you, if God has a people that are willing to call the Lord their God, God will put in place who he wants to put in place regardless of your elections. God will raise up and put into power people who he thinks he wants to have ruling and reigning in that place. Read the Bible about that one. So, no matter if, it, you know, if people are living wickedly and just completely turn their back on the Lord, I don't care if it's the best political leader, even for our value system and everything else were to get elected, God will still judge the people. If everyone's doing wickedly, right? Now you may have a little bit of time of respite, but God's still gonna, gonna hold the people responsible. The people, the heart of the people need to change. And the only way to do that is by bringing the word of God and, and letting the word of God transform lives. I came to this realization a long time ago. I used to, there was a time, was it 2007, when I was considering getting involved politically. And I actually started getting involved politically. I, start, I became a precinct committee man. I was getting involved locally. I was going to my local Republican, you know, uh, uh, office and, and, and trying to get involved and do campaigning and do all that other stuff. I actually did. I started getting involved. But very quickly I realized, hey, first of all, they didn't really like me there. They liked the way things were. They liked status quo. They liked their good old boy club and the people that already knew each other and they're going to put in their time and they're going to get promoted. And you know, They liked the way things were. I didn't like the way things were. I wanted things to be a lot different. 
But then, I, you know, after getting a little bit more wisdom, especially from the Word of God, I realized, you know what, the true change that needs to happen isn't going to happen through politics. I'm not going to debate somebody on foreign policy or on our immigration policy or on, you know, like, like these other policies that the government's going to have to win over their heart and their mind, right? You need the Word of God to, to, to bring that change. And like I said, if that happens, the, the D and the R thing will work itself out. It really will. When, when people could get the mindset of, hey, I'm bringing all my thoughts into obedience of Christ, now you're going to start thinking, even in polit political terms, in, well, what would God say is right? Amen. Regardless of which party is talking about anything, like, hey, let's just try to get things biblical. Amen. Then I don't have to persuade them about jumping ship from one party to another. Who cares? You get, you know, they care about something much more important and much higher, much deeper the truth, the things of God, then, then it's done its job. First Timothy chapter 1, it's the next place I want to turn to, First Timothy chapter 1. Again, we're looking at time to war. Primarily, we're looking at the time to war. We know that the time to peace is just, in general, like how we ought to be living our day-to-day -day life, peaceably, seeking peace. And you know what? We're bringing peace by the gospel. But bringing the gospel also brings war. <laughs> so while we're trying to bring peace, we're actually going to be attacked and be part of a war. It's, it's, it's the same thing. Doing the same thing brings both results. It's interesting. It's kind of a paradoxical. First Timothy chapter 1, verse number 18, the Bible reads, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. So the Apostle Paul is charging Timothy here. He says, I I'm, I'm committing this charge unto you. Okay, I want you to know this. And he says, according to the prophecies which went before on thee. So he he's already received these prophecies. He's received the preaching of the word of God. Timothy has been instructed in those ways. He says that thou by them, by what? By the prophecies, by the teachings, by the preaching, that, that by them you might war good warfare. So you need to use the teachings, use these prophecies to engage in the battle, engage in the fight, Gert, being girt about with the truth. And he's saying, now you're, now, hey, soldier, this is your charge. Go out and fight that good fight. Holding faith in a good conscience, which some, having put away concerning faith, have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. And he's identifying some of the enemies here, Hymenaeus and Alexander. He's like, look, they need to be delivered unto Satan. Why, it's a spiritual battle. Did he say, I'm going to go and, you know, cut their throats and just <laughs> stop that problem? I'm going si to silence? No. He's like, no, Satan's going to deal with them. Right? I, I don't have to physically do anything to them. They've been causing a lot of problems, but you know what? They're just delivered unto Satan. Let, let, let that work itself out. And, you know, just like the Bible says, we're not called unto vengeance, you know, the, that, that the Lord will revenge. He's the one that ultimately will make sure that if the government's not even doing their job of holding responsible the evildoers, God will. At the end of the day, justice is always served. Always. Turn, if you would, to, uh, let's see. Turn to Jude. I'm going I'm to close on Jude. There's a few other passages I want to reference real quick here. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, the Bible says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. He's saying, look, you know, endure hardness. Things are going to be hard, but hey, you're a soldier, Amen. right? You're a soldier of Christ. Amen. There's a time of war, and you know what? A soldier needs to be hard. You can't just be some softy. And um, you can't get entangled with the things of this life and get distracted with all of the other things you could be distracted with this in this life. You've got a battle going on, Amen. right? It's important to keep focus. Keep focus on the truth. Keep focus on the Word of God. Keep focus on the things of God so that you can stay in the fight. 
Don't let the cares of this world and the riches and all the money and toys and, and all the other distractions and pleasures and things that you could have here, you know, the pleasures of sin for a season. Moses, he, he rejected the pleasures of sin for the short time that he was going to be on this earth. He recognized that, you know what? It's not really all it's cracked up to be anyways. I want to do something that really matters. You know what? That's going to bring hardness. Because then he was rejected from Pharaoh's household that he grew up in and had Pharaoh against him. And he was just like, you know what, though? I'm, I'm going to do what's right. That's fine. I'm not going to be distracted. And, and look at what he did. Look at the, I mean, he led the children of Israel out of captivity and was used of God tremendously. Why? Because he, he allowed himself to endure hardness and he stuck with it and he stayed with it all the way through. He was a soldier. He was a spiritual soldier. He had lots of people coming out against him and threatening him and everything else, threatening him with his life. Even some of his own people <laughs> were, were, were threatening against him. But he stayed the course. And you know what? God was able to protect him from all. No matter where any threat might be coming from, God protected him through all of it. He kept that shield of faith through the whole way and, and was able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Story after story, we have people in the Bible that, that are able to do that. And you know what? God will equip you for the battle as well. We saw the armor of God. Those are the things we want to focus on to make sure we're well equipped. But you know what? God will equip you. In the Psalms, you don't have to turn there, but the Bible says, uh, you know, David refers to this in Psalm 18. He says, it is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. God gives me the strength to fight. God's the one who, who is strengthening me for this battle. He maketh my feet like hinds feet and setteth me upon my high places. He teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. He said, God's the one. Now, obviously, a bow of steel, these things, a physical battle. Yeah, he faced a lot of physical battles, but you know what? He was trusting in the Lord for all those things, and he said, and he's giving God all the credit because God's the one who kept him safe. God's the one who led him. He sought God in all of his battles and said, hey, God, should I go up against these people? Should I not go up against these people? What should I do, Lord? He was a king. He had to deal with wars. He had to deal with battles, but every time he was seeking the right thing to do by seeking God first. So we apply those physical battles spiritually still do we seek the lord say hey god what is right what is the right thing for me to do and stand and do it the right way Amen. and god will strengthen you and god will teach your hands to war as it were you know in his word the time to war now, I mentioned a lot of different things, cultural things, wickedness that's, that's out there in high places. But you know what? There's even a battle within the ranks. And it's also a battle that needs to be fought. Now, by and large, I think there's a lot of things that people can disagree on and it shouldn't be that big of a deal. Now, of course, the Word of God, everything is important in, in the sense that it's, it's the Word of God, right? Everything, everything has weight and value and importance and we should strive to understand everything in Scripture as much as possible. But there, we know that there's going to be areas that not everyone's going to agree on, right? There's, there's some things that we just don't fully understand. And there's some things that someone might be convinced one way or some people another thing. But those are not the most important things. And we should be able to look past a lot of that. You know, I've said this many times. The thi every single thing that I preach from the pulpit, you don't have to agree with everything that comes out of my mouth to be a member of our church or something like that, that's crazy, right? This isn't a cult, and there's going to be people that are believers and are saved, they have difference of opinion on many things. But when it comes to the gospel, that is a hard line. That is a hard line. And that is a fight that is definitely worth fighting for. And that is something you should never back down from is when it comes to the gospel. I've had people try to, to yoke up and join up. See, we're not ecumenical here. We don't, I don't believe, we don't believe in just joining up with every organization that wants to call themselves Christian and just group together. And see, those are the people that have this more of a peace at all costs mindset. 
As I mentioned at the very beginning, it's not peace at all costs, okay? There's things you have to be able to stand on, and you know, there's things that you have to be agreed on to walk side by side and join together. Now, I have plenty of churches where we are very friendly with. I mentioned the announcements, other activities going on, and hey, go to this activity, go to that activity, and you know what? Some of them, they might teach some different things than we do in different areas. Fine, it doesn't matter. You know why, though? Because they are born-again believers in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. They are absolutely 100% right on their doctrine when it comes to salvation, which is the most important thing in the world. Because if you're wrong on salvation, you're literally going to be damning people to hell. And if you're wrong on salvation, you're not a child of God. You're not my brother or sister in Christ. So yeah, that's a hard line. That's a hard stand that we need to take. In Jude, the book of Jude, verse number three, the Bible says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Now, contend means to fight, right? I mean, there's a, you think of a contention. Um, a contention would be a strife or a fight. Now, we are not to be contentious people, like always looking to get in a fight, but there is a time to contend. And here it says earnestly contend. I mean, you, you need to be like really into this with earnest. Hey, I'm going to fight this fight. I'm going to fight this battle. And that, look, we're, you know, he, we're being exhorted to earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And he says, why? Why is this such a big deal? Verse 4, for there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. There are people who try to creep in and get in behind the lines, so to speak. The wolves in sheep's clothing that will try to get in and, and bring in heresies and bring in false gospels. And this is something, man, if you don't know what I'm talking about, read the New Testament. This happens over and over and over again. Read the book of Galatians. What is the big deal? The Apostle Paul, he wrote an entire, I mean, the entire book of Galatians is basically, now there's other content in there, but, but it's really, the, the whole point was, hey, you've got people in there trying to teach you another gospel. And he's saying, I don't care if it's me or an angel from heaven teaches any other gospel unto you. He says, let that person be accursed. Let him be accursed. Amen. Galatians chapter 1. He says, that, that guy needs to be cursed out, and I don't care who the source is. If it's any other gospel than that which you have received, let him be accursed. And that is a lion in the sand, and that's a fight. And they were coming in trying to say, oh, you need to be circumcised. Or faith isn't enough. You have to be circumcised. Just like there's people today, well, faith isn't enough. You have to also be baptized. Well, faith isn't enough. You have to go to church. You have to follow the commandments. You have to do this. You have to do that. No, look, it's faith alone for salvation. Amen. And I will fight on that, and I will fight till the day I die. And I don't care. You know, if someone tries to bring in a false gospel here, get ready for a fight. And there's people, you know, I teach people all the time that don't come to our church or live somewhere else and they go to other churches. Hey, if they've got the right gospel, great. You know, there's a lot of things you might disagree with them on, but just suck it up. Don't cause problems. Be a blessing to that church, your brother and sister in Christ. But you know what? If a church starts teaching a false gospel and some damnable heresies, then fight for that. And get out then, because that's, that's not right. That's a stand. That's a line in the sand that you need to have drawn. Because there are wicked people out there that are lying in wait and trying to beguile simple souls and people who don't know better and trying to send people to hell. That's a real thing. And I'm not going to join up with those people. We got, I'm fighting against those people. I'm not going to join up with the Jehovah's Witnesses on something. I'm fighting against them. They go out and knock on doors, damning people to hell. I'm not going to, I don't care what their stance is on abortion. I'm not going to yoke up with them. There's a time of war and a time of peace. And these two, uh, as I mentioned before, they're linked. They're linked uh, like you, you cannot separate them in one sense. Because if you are for peace and you're preaching the gospel of peace, there will be war coming your way. You need to be ready for that war. It's appropriate. It's proper to 
fight in these spiritual battles. As the Bible lays out, as Scripture is laid out uh, and given us enough information to discern, well, when is it appropriate to stand? When is it appropriate to speak up? Well, when, when, uh, if the Word of God is being trashed, you know, are you going to defend it or not? Think about it this way. Think about it this way. You have a, a son or a daughter, right? And they're out, and they're, they're among their friends or whatever, and someone just starts trashing you and saying all kinds of wicked, bad things about you that are not true, and your own child just goes along with it or doesn't correct them or doesn't stand up for you, doesn't defend you, that's going to probably hurt a little bit, Amen. right? Amen. And I'm not talking about some little kid who, you know, really just doesn't, doesn't know anything, but the ones that, that grow up and are a little bit stronger and they should, they should know better, they should be able to stick up and stand up for you, well, I mean, we're children of God, and you, you know, we're sitting around people who are going to be trashing and bad-mouthing the Lord and His Word and stuff. We ought to be able to stand up and, and, and say, no, you know what, that's my Heavenly Father. Like, don't, don't, you don't talk that way about, about the Word of God. That's the truth. At the very least, tell them you're wrong. You're in error. Because that is a loving thing to do, is to tell somebody where they're, where they're not right, especially about important things. Instead of pretending like, oh, no, I'm just going to pretend like you're right. That doesn't help that person at all. So no matter how you slice it, you're going to have to get involved. If you care about people, you got to get involved because you need to tell them the truth. If you care about someone, you're not going to lie to them. Don't, don't think that lying helps anything. So you got to tell them the truth. Well, what's the truth? Well, the truth might offend. You know what? The truth will offend. The truth will divide. Jesus already said that. So now it's back on you. What are you going to do? Are you going to stand for the truth? Or are you going to sit idly by and just let the world go to hell in a handbasket? Join us. Join us this afternoon. Join us for, for preaching the gospel. If you've never done that before, come out and be a part of it. We'll show you how to do it. You don't have to do anything. Just show up. You come along. We'll pair you up. You could be a silent partner. You could go side by side with one of our church members that goes and opens up our Bible and preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ to people, preaches them the truth. We love people. We don't want them to go to hell. This is what we're all about. This is what we do. Now, it may be a little uncomfortable for you. It was really uncomfortable for me when the first time I did it, the first year or two that I did it, it was really uncomfortable for me. It took a while before I finally got comfortable with it. But, you know, we are soldiers, I don't think, you know, I'm pretty sure. Now, I've never been in combat, and I've never been in the military. But I'm pretty sure there's a lot of anxiety when a soldier is about to go into battle. I don't know. I mean, maybe I can't have an opinion about that because I wasn't a soldier, but I'm pretty sure there's probably 100% of the soldiers just about would have a lot of anxiety unless they're really hardened veterans that have done it over and over and over again. Well, we're not telling you to go out and pick up guns and shoot someone's brains out. <laughs> In fact, we're doing the exact opposite. We're telling you to go out with the sword, which is the word of God, and, and show people how they can have peace. Peace with God, peace in their life, everlasting peace and comfort. We've got a good message. We've got a good, uh, good news. But it's incumbent upon us to go out and do that. And you know what? It is a spiritual battle. We're engaged in the battle. But, but have the boldness and, and have the faith and the courage to just to stand up for what's right. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we love you. Thank you so much for um, all, all that you can teach us from your word. Thank you for saving us. We thank you for the gift of salvation that you paid the whole way for us. And that the only thing you ask of us to, uh, for, for, our, for our own salvation is just to put our trust in you, to, to believe that, uh, that you really did pay and make the sacrifice for all of our sins. God, we thank you for that. We thank you for eternal life. God, please help us, embolden us. As Apostle Paul was, was um, requesting prayers for his boldness through his own circumstances, Lord, help us here. Even though we may not be facing as, as hard of a time, Lord, still, nonetheless, help us to, 
be emboldened to stand up for what's right and to not dwell on, on threats and things that the enemy might try to, to say or do to cause us to not stand for you, Lord, but that we would be strengthened in your word and that we would um, just stand strong uh, with, a, with a shield of faith to defend us all the way through, Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.